Hello guys, Hello. Um, and welcome to the third episode of the Drugstore Culture Podcast. Um, I'm sure at some point we'll lose track of how many there are, but it's, it's kind of easy at the moment. Um, thanks for coming in, Nikki. Um, probably best if you say who you are. <laughs> yeah, okay, so my name's Nikki Hodgson. Um, I'm an author and broadcaster on sex and relationships, primarily, and um, I've just written a new book on the history of dating. Um, which is there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the Curious History of Dating, yep, from Jane Austen to Tinder, which is a 300 year romp through <laughs> serious history, actually, of how people have met, married, tarried, divorced over the years. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I found, I found that it's been really beneficial to get the long view so mm-hmm. that it informs better my writing about the present. Yeah. Because there are lots of things I didn't know about the history of how people have um, got it on in the past. <laughs> which have shocked and surprised and delighted me and um, and prove that we're not just in this horrible, super liberal um, microcosm where yeah. everybody's just kind of like shagging each other at free will and doesn't have any, um, doesn't have the capacity to stay in a long-term relationship, etc. Mm. Things have not actually been that different over 300 years. Well, I will so. say, uh, I hope you don't mind saying it's a really, really good book. Thank you. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> You also did write something more important than your book <laughs> recently, uh, which was a... Yes. Um, I wrote uh, an article for Drug Store Culture yeah. um, about my days as a dominatrix, or rather reflecting on my days mm-hmm. since. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was breaking into the media, I dommed for cash, basically, yeah. when I was interning for free. And uh, over the years, I've written about it a lot, but... It isn't since I've gotten to this stage of my career and I'm so far removed from it that I think I've had better and more interesting insights. So the piece is really about that. How do I feel five years on now that I don't have to rely on it at all for money anymore? Well, it is definitely an insightful piece. Um, <laughs> and I think we will explore it a little bit more through this podcast. But sure. um, first, um, Olive. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> My name is Olive Pomethi and I am the assistant editor at Drugstore Culture. Cool. I have not published a book recently. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you, are, you are on your second week in the job as well. Yeah, second week. So, new all round. Um, <laughs> well, I hope you're enjoying it so far. Uh, and this is your first podcast as well. Very first podcast ever. Good. Um, so, um, just some behind the scenes stuff. Um, we brought you in today, Nikki, because I should say we're recording this on a Wednesday. Mm-hmm. Tomorrow, Thursday, was going to be the day when Harvey Weinstein appeared. Uh, well, it was his hearing in Manhattan, but that has been pushed back to November. Um, so we got you in to talk about Weinstein and Me mm-hmm. Too and all that kind of stuff. Um, but even though that hearing has been pushed back, um, this week there's been so much similar stuff you know we've had Sean Penn saying um, I've got his quote written down uh, basically said that it's dividing men and women uh, and he said it's uh, me too is too black and white Mm -hmm. Um, we've had um, Brett Kavanaugh the the potential Supreme Court judge has been accused of um, sort of groping and pulling at a woman's clothes in, in 1982 when he was a student when they were both students um, and we've even had Jermaine Greer talking about rape and quite controversial ru- ru- um, quite controversial stuff about her new essay on rape. Um, I mean, the fact of the matter is a day does not go by without a Me Too-ish kind of a story. Um, so yeah, so you've come in. We can always talk about Me Too, I think. I think I it's think like so. a big cultural thing, certainly. Yeah, yeah. And you were saying earlier, Olive, it's, it's almost a year to the day since... Yeah, it's almost the anniversary of the first article that was published by Renan Farrow. So yeah. Um, I mean, it's certainly been it's the, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, cultural story of the past year, yeah. Yeah. I guess, and we'll be talking for a long time to come. Um, Olive, would you mind talking, because you also wrote an article about Me Too yeah. um, several months ago, which I, I think is one of the defining articles of Me Too journalism. So would you mind just um, (laughs) describing it a little bit? Yeah, so I wrote a piece for GQ who did a series of articles on Me Too. And my piece was called Why I'm Now Afraid of Men. And it was kind of about how, I mean, we were having this conversation in the office and a lot of men, like the men in the office were saying, 
that they were reassessing the relationships that they'd had in the past and wondering like is it like have have I done things that aren't okay or you know how do we act now like it's almost like I know a lot of men say they're always almost scared of how to act around women now because they just don't know what's acceptable because so many things have been normalized for so long and I kind of said well it's kind of changed the way I think about men and also my relationships too because I guess I mean I'm quite young I was like I was quite naive and I looked back at my like past experiences with like boys at school and like just men in the street and I was like that wasn't okay that was weird mm. what happened and even if I told people about what happened like if I told my friends we just thought it was funny because we thought you know boys get a bit handsy at parties that's just what happens and that's life so I kind of wrote about that and then I also wrote about how just in general in life I've just feel I don't really know how to act around men or mm. not that I don't know how to act around men like I want to trust men mm. but it's difficult to with all of the news that's come out in the past year. Yeah. Yeah. And do you feel Olive that the news has directly impacted on you know, if somebody casually asks you in a coffee shop or something, if it's all right to sit near you or something, that you'd have a, a different reaction now than you would have done before me too? I think so. I don't... I think also a point to say is that from writing that article, you know, like I've, I've grown up a little bit and yeah. I've got... I, I generally just moved down to London at that point as well, so there was a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so I feel like I'm more confident in myself and my ability to, like, interact with other adults and trust them. But... I do think that I'm always just a little bit wary of what people's agendas might be and beforehand I might not have been. Mm -hmm. And I think the main thing is like, it's mainly about strangers, it's if I'm like passing someone on the street at night or like I say in the article, like if I'm on the tube carriage at night and like another man gets on and but we're the only two people in the carriage, I probably will leave the carriage and go into a, another carriage. And not because that person looks particularly dodgy, but just because you never know. Yes, it's great and simple line that you use a couple of times in the article which is you know just in case and I just think that's very striking that you, you're sort of making a balance of risks and thinking you know it might not be <laughs> ideal to move carriage but the worst that can happen is is very very bad yeah you know mm. um is, is that something you still feel you know that like you're making these trade-offs in your head and balancing risk and yeah I mean I think a lot of women do that because yeah. like you said you never know you don't know what someone's and if, I suppose it's unfair because you could say that you never know what women are thinking or what women are going to do but the fact is in the media at the moment we're seeing that men are doing a lot more bad things than women in, yeah. in, in, in terms of like sex yeah. and, and so I think certainly like me and my friends there are certain things that we would do mm -hmm. to make sure that we stay safe like we will avoid men if possible, like we'll cross the street if there's a man walking like on the, on, the, on the side of the street that we're walking on at night time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I actually don't do this at the moment because I live a bit closer to a tube station, but before um, I would like have my keys between my knuckles at night time to make sure that if anyone did try to attack me, I would mm. be prepared. Um, and it's all kind of stuff that to me seems like common sense to do, but I was actually quite shocked at the response to the GQPs because a lot of men who read it were really surprised that I was doing these things, whereas to, to other women mm, that's just normal. just normal. And I got loads of messages off other women saying like, oh, this is amazing, this is, this is exactly how I feel. And to, yeah, it's just normal, that's been normal to us our whole lives, but to men what's been normal is just being able to take advantage of women. Yeah. Nikki, in your, in your piece it's quite striking actually having you both here, because in your piece of drugstore culture, you also describe a sort of train encounter <laughs> and seeing yeah. a man staring at you. And um, Olive's response was to feel threatened. Your response was to stare down the man. <laughs> was to go into uh, battle, yeah, yeah basically. You described, <laughs> I've written it down, the power of the hard stare. Yeah. Um, would you talk about that a bit? And also, I just wonder if your past, um, you know, has sort of hardened you to this? Do you, do you have a sort of... Um, I don't know, do you, are you strong? Yeah, you know? yeah, I would hope so. It's a really interesting phenomenon. So as I was describing, 
as a woman, you're so used to somebody trying to chat you up when you're not in the mood for it or it's yeah. not appropriate or um, staring at you for too long in a train, train carriage. And this is what happened to me just two weeks ago. And of course, I'm 35 now. I've had years of people just doing things, so I kind of don't get upset anymore. Um, but this particularly annoyed me because I was sat with my partner and it was obvious that we were together. Now, a partner shouldn't be a reason not to hit on someone in a way. It shouldn't be a safety catch, but you think there'd be some... I don't know, acknowledgement that this person is not available for you yeah. to kind of have a pop at. And um, and that's what kind of really fired me up. I get really protective of my, you know, my domain and my relationship yeah. and what I've created for myself, especially after years of having been a sex worker, where frankly, I never envisaged that I would be able to have a long-term relationship with somebody that would have would be able to accept what I'd done. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm probably more protective than other people would be in, in that regard. But yeah, basically what happened was just very standard guys kind of like leering at me and um, I was wearing this dress actually, it's really funny. <laughs> I did nothing particularly provocative or, I don't know, it wouldn't matter anyway, but you know, nothing that I thought would attract undue attention. And um, the fire kind of went up in me mm -hmm. and um, I just was like, this is not acceptable like what you're doing. You're trying to actually intimidate me as well and kind of like grind me down. Mm -hmm. He just kept looking at me and it didn't matter what I did, got my phone out, was reading a paper, talked to my partner. It's like, you just won't stop. And I was so annoyed I was gonna go up to him. And then I thought, no, it's way better to like stare right back at him and just basically stare him down. Mm -hmm. Because as a woman, you're never taught to do something like that. And yeah. it feels frightening actually when you first learn to do it. Mm -hmm. And the reason I am able to do it is because I use a bit dominatrix. So I kind of have time to practice in, this, in what was a safe space actually with a client who wasn't going to attack me if he didn't like what I was doing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And um, because I've learned to do that over the years, I, you know, I made a judgment call and I thought, well, this guy isn't going to go crazy in the carriage because there's all these people watching him, but I can probably put him in his place if I give him a really hard, long stare back. And that's exactly what I did. And you could see him just kind of like retract and like, was like, oh my God, what? Who, who would do that kind of thing? You could sort of see it kind of going Did that through stop him. him dead? He, uh, yeah, he was really, and he, 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 he looked ashamed. He mm -hmm. looked deeply ashamed. Yeah. And, um, you know, and it took like a good, like six seconds of really like looking at him, like yeah. before he would stop. Cause I don't think he understood what was going on because <laughs> we're not taught to do it, right? Yeah. So it's something that um, after I was a dom, I thought, oh, actually this is a really useful life skill now to just yeah. not be, be less afraid. Yeah. Now that doesn't mean that there isn't risk. Yeah. It just means that when it's somebody who's actually quite low level mm -hmm. um, and they're not gonna do anything, you really can like train them basically to not <laughs> do it again. Cause I sort of think as a woman who's getting a bit older, it's really important to me to protect other women yeah. and other vulnerable people. So if I've got the power to do that and don't feel afraid, then it's kind of my duty to do it. Mm -hmm. And um, and I don't want him, if, if that's, you know, if he does it to me, does he do it to girls that are, you know, Olive's age or younger, you know, teenagers? Like that would just make me feel so angry. And so that's the thing that I can do in that situation. I don't need to raise my voice, say a word, call anybody else for help, but that's the one thing I can do. Yeah. Now there's plenty of situations where that's not appropriate. Mm -hmm. And um, and I've unfortunately been privy to them. At the beginning of this year, I was severely sexually assaulted. Um, I was orally raped. I've written about it for The Guardian. And um, it was by a man that I didn't know that got into a taxi when I was taking myself home at the end of the night. And I reported him to the police and there was no, there was no evidence by the time I reported him because it's all forensic evidence and um, they couldn't find him. And then that was just the end of it really. And that's what happens lots of times when people report sexual assault. And again, I was lucky because I have a really supportive partner and a really good network of friends and family, but it did knock me for a few weeks and I was doing the same, like looking over my shoulder and, and you know, not wanting to be out after dark and all that kind of thing. And what was, what was even kind of more frustrating is I got into an altercation with a radio host who I won't name at this point in time, but um, he, he didn't believe me when I told him my story because he was having a discussion about, um, about Me Too and about Jilly Cooper's comments about, um, thinking Me Too has gone too far and uh, you know we're blowing it out of proportion and that men are afraid to flirt that was the phrase yeah. which really got my back up mm -hmm. and I tried to kind of you know sort of quite carefully argue the opposite and say well no it's kind of high time that men thought a bit more as Olive's written and um, and the host just wouldn't have any of it and then I had to kind of reveal my own experience or I, I chose to do it because I thought well you need to see that this is still going on yeah. <laughs> quite severe harassment and abuse and um, he just did the classic victim blaming, start to pull the whole discussion apart, like ask me everything about why did you do this? Why were you at this point alone? Why had you been drinking? Why, you know, just like the classic interrogation that 
won't wash anymore, certainly with the, the police who were actually amazing with me when I reported it. And um, so it just kind of got me thinking again about this topic. So when that guy then on the train sort of went for it, I was like, no, nobody gets the better of me anymore. I've mm. absolutely had enough. So I think for me, it's kind of a positive channel of my energy to just kind of put a really strong boundary up with people. Because I think again, and Olive might agree with me, I think as women, we're always taught to sort of appease men, you know, sort yeah. of apologize almost for their or behavior. Just ignore it. Like, yep. Or pretend it hasn't yeah. happened. Because I'm so trained in like, you know, when someone's like trying to chat you up on the street or like yep. shouting stuff at you and you're just like, go in the zone. Like, yep. Do not look at them. Don't like, yep. even don't engage. Maybe, just pretend mm-hmm. that they're not there. Yeah. But it's really interesting that you have actually made the decision to, you know, actually yeah. acknowledge what they're doing is wrong. But I mean, it depends on the situation. It's like, I probably felt empowered because it was, you know, it's like six o'clock, it's broad daylight. I'm on a very packed train and I'm with my partner. So I've got yeah. all these kinds of like safety mechanisms in place to do yeah. this with this person. Um, would I do that when it's just me and somebody else in a carriage? Maybe not, I don't know. Um, and pick the wrong person, it's not gonna end well as well. So, you know. I'm saying that's something that I would do. It wouldn't be suitable for everyone to do. I heard that radio interview and it was really quite horrible. Um, I guess I wonder, is this something, you know, obviously that was that was on radio, everyone heard it, but is this something that you encounter frequently off air? Um, do you find that men aren't willing to believe the horrible situations that some women are put through or um, are some men good at empathizing? It's absolutely a spectrum and there are lots of amazing men who were, I mean, what I was absolutely positively impressed with after that debate were just how many men came out and sent me private messages and emails, people that I didn't know saying that was an appalling discussion. You know, I would, that just worries me for my children and and my family and I wouldn't want anyone to think that that was acceptable as a way of interviewing you about that subject. So I actually felt that's what my understanding of the world is actually that we're talking about a small proportion of people that are real troublemakers or or really refuse to acknowledge this as an issue. Mm-hmm. But then as Olive puts it, a, a broader spectrum of people that have been kind of practicing things or engaging in behaviors that are not really consensual and not really respectful, but would never consider themselves to be rapists or um, you know, kind of sexually violent in any way. Mm-hmm. We were saying earlier that it's been um, about a year now since the first Me Too allegations. Um, But if we just think about that year and the year that you have had, Nikki, I mean, um, you've experienced a very horrible sexual assault. Um, There was that radio interview um, and, and even the encounter on the train, which, you know, is by far the least serious of all those, but it was still something and in the end you had to employ your your hard stare as you call it um do do you feel that me too has actually changed anything because that's quite a horrible catalogue of events i think it has made a difference i just don't feel that we'll feel the ramifications yet because um in the most positive sense and what i mean by that is the conversations opened up but the, we're trying to turn back hundreds if not thousands of years of behavior <laughs> And, you know, there's going to be plenty of people that say we shouldn't be trying to do that. Actually, this is just innate to how men and women are, you know, that kind of social psychology stuff about, well, you know, if men weren't designed to kind of dominate women all the time, then the majority of them wouldn't be doing it. And it's like, no, that's not how this works. Um, So I think we are a year on, but that doesn't mean that we're going to have fixed it and come up with a better system of interacting in a year. It means we're just at the beginning of a conversation that I think is going to take at least the better part of a decade. Yeah. Yeah. I also think that we work in the media, so we're really in tune to this kind yeah. of stuff, but I think there are a lot of people who, you know, either they don't know or care about me too. Like, I don't know how many people outside of journalism talk about it as much as we yeah. probably do. I think that's a really that's good point. Good point. Yeah. Back home, like, so my family is from Hull, yeah. and I know when I was talking about it, when I think when I was first talking about this piece that was did for GQ and I mentioned it, to someone back home, I can't remember specifically who, <laughs> sorry, um, but they didn't really understand what I was talking about, they didn't really understand what the movement was. They, I think that they obviously knew about Harvey Weinstein and yeah. all of that, but they didn't know that it had turned to such a huge thing in the media and that so many people were coming forward and like so many stories were coming out. So 
And especially like it's in social media thing as well, like it's hashtag me too. Mm. If you're not on social media, you probably feel the impact a lot less. Yeah, I, I think it is interesting having the conversation in smaller communities as well, because I'm also from Yorkshire and I don't really go back anymore. But the place that I do go to is my new home in Brisbane because my family emigrated there. And that, despite being a city, big city for Australia, still has quite a small town um, men mentality. And Australians um, in Queensland are quite, they tend to have more old fashioned values around gender and, and you know, what the role should be in a, in a kind of dating situation and things like that and I, I think if you put forward some of the complaints there you'll get a different kind of response also from women not just from guys but just saying well I've been amazed how many women don't want to get involved with me too or say it's nothing to do with me or I don't think like this or the men in my life would never do this that's not true there's always one guy that you've known like I never believe that when someone says that to me mm. but I think there's so much invested as well as a whole culture in you know, maintaining the norm because we're about to break open this massive social contract basically between men and women. Yeah. And I think what's also really interesting for me is when I, I didn't really write about it in the domination piece, but I could have done is when I was first working as a dominatrix, what fascinated me was how many men would come to apologize for being themselves. And that's gonna sound quite peculiar because we sort of think that men just always have this kind of bravado and kind of like, you know, bluster through life, ignoring their own failings, yeah. but they don't, they just often don't reveal them the way that women are more forthcoming. And um, so many times when guys would come to me, you know, they they kind of want to apologize for their own sexuality. Mm -hmm. And that was a combination of things. One, sometimes not having a very good control of their own impulses. Two, probably never having good sex education or someone to talk about it with. So feeling a lot of shame around sexuality, even when it was like perfectly innocuous. Um, and three, just kind of the weight of feeling, I don't know if what I'm doing is right. And so many times they start off with a kind of confession about, you know, I was staring at somebody on the train, like it would literally start like that. So they would have an awareness, the people that would come to me, that what they were doing was probably not that okay. Yeah. And then, you know, then we'd create some kind of erotic scene that we'd play out as a kind of punishment for it. And I would always wonder, does that mean when you go on the train next time, you're gonna do exactly the same thing or you're gonna think about this session so you're not quite as present and then that's kind of helpful in, in taking you out of a kind of, of an interaction that might you know, offend or harm someone. You, you mentioned education. Yeah. Um, how, how important is, is education in all this? I guess like, you know, women can do things, mm -hmm. they can employ the hard stare in certain yeah. situations, but, but also like a lot of this has to come from men. Yeah. Um, you know, how, how do you change men? Well, men have to lead other men, I think. Um, the men that tend to listen to women tend to be the men that are already respectful of women, in my experience. You know, it wouldn't occur to them not to listen to a woman just because she's female, you know? So it's the men that won't be, won't be talked at by women that are the ones that are the hardest to reach. And it's only the good example of other men, in my belief, that can help them. Do you think the bad example of other men also helps so you know when um you've got harvey weinstein and others facing allegations and they're, they're having to appear in court do you think this is something that other men might think oh gosh i need to reevaluate my own behavior or or i mean could it even be something that um they see as something distant and you know that goes on among rich men in hollywood and it couldn't possibly be something that i do or my friends do um, you know, is, is, is there a benefit to this? I guess just because they're on, these people are on trial, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to convince these people that what they've done is wrong. Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot yeah. of people who don't believe that people who've had like sexual misconduct allegations against them should be punished. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know, I guess it depends on the person, really. But I don't think it would seem like a threat to their behaviour if just watching other people be punished for yeah. it. I think it's interesting. I think people who are watching someone else be tried or convicted of something they may have done, mm -hmm. either do one of two things. They kind of separate mentally. So if they've, if they've done the same activity, they kind of shut down and, and disassociate, or they start to panic and they reassess. Mm -hmm. But equally, they can be in the first category and they can think, well, that applies to him and what he did was different because he did it this way and I would never do it that way. You know, there's all these kinds of small excuses that will come out in the reframing of it. Yeah. And um, and actually, I think that's quite yeah. Sorry, Lee, we've actually sort of seen that playing out publicly. Yeah, people will of course, we are, we are. And then we discover that the, the critic in that yeah. case doing 
similar things. Yeah, exactly. But in their heads, it's different because of, and I think that tells you something really important about human sexuality, how lots of people will justify um, what they do because it's what they desire. So they think, well, it's natural to me, so therefore it must be kind of natural to do, which isn't necessarily, when I say natural to do, what I mean by that is acceptable to do or like, you know, ethically yeah. conscious. Um, everything's natural if it's doable. I mean, that's just being human, isn't it? But you understand what I'm saying by that, you know, mm. um, this idea that, well, if I've had the idea and it turns me on, then there must be a channel for it. Well, there probably is um, for the majority of things, not everything. Um, but that channel, the channel you choose is very, very important to whether it's consensual and ethical and good for you and for society or not. You mentioned earlier 10 years, you said it will be about 10 years until um, the sort of revolution unfolds itself. Um, I, just, I was just sort of wondering, like, what, what does it look like in 10 years? What does success actually look like? Um, and, and as well, like, will success necessarily happen? Um, are there any roadblocks in the way? Um, yeah. Well, Olive, what do you think? Well, I think, I think ten year, in 10 years' time it will be better. I think a key factor in that is the fact that I think the next generation will be much more aware of how to, like, approach sexual situations. Mm-hmm. I think even, like, guys my age are aware of Me Too. I guess what I was saying earlier about how many people do have Me Too reached, it's probably also a generational thing just because younger people are on social media and I think a lot of I mean there's a lot of a lot of amazing women my age who are like very vocal about it and like I know even just people I've known in my personal life they've come out on social media and talking about you know if they've suffered from you know like sexual abuse so I think there's a much broader understanding than there probably was 10 years ago so I do think that the generation that's coming through will conduct themselves better in the future um and I don't really see how we can go backwards from here. I think mm-hmm. it's been such a huge shift mm-hmm. in the way that we approach culture. And even just things that have come out of it, like TV shows and books and stuff like that, it's just changed everything. Yeah. And Harvey Weinstein was so influential and he's been brought down by it. I just, yeah. he's not gonna, I, I mean, I don't know if he's gonna get away with it. <laughs> In a, in a way, he hasn't though, has yeah. he? Because it's the idea that he was untouchable and he isn't. And I think that has always been a problem for hundreds of years, for thousands of years, in real life and in literature and in culture, these representations of being untouchable. Yeah. And that's shifted. And that's what I think is so seismic about it. How much of a problem is Donald Trump? Um, it seems to me that he's always the grand counterexample to any sort of positive narrative. Um, we know the things he said. Um, we know some of the things he's done and we know the allegations against him um, and yet he is president yeah I mean he he does deeply worry me um, it's interesting because a while ago I was um, writing about the porn industry a lot for the Guardian um, and for men's health and I was based in in porn valley in San Fernando Valley in, in LA just outside of LA and um, at the time I encountered Stormy Daniels quite regularly and lots of other similar women of her ilk who were just amazing. Um, They were amazing speakers, they were amazing performers, amazing choreographers and brilliant businesswomen. And to see her go up against him is really, um, I don't know, it feels amazing to watch her do it because she, for me, is the only person that can bring him down. Mm -hmm. But I think what's fascinating is that, you know, a decade ago, if you had any kind of involvement with a porn star that could at all be proved, at all all be proven there is no way you would have been able to stay in office and what kind of makes me angry is the increasing positive attitude to sex that we have and a kind of sexual liberalization is actually allowing some people like Donald Trump to get off even though he would never fight for it and that makes me angry and frustrated because he's done nothing to to deserve actually people not caring about whether he's been with a porn star or not or paid somebody off you know that was the right of people that wanted emancipation and he never has done. So that kind of gets me angry. Um, but I mean, it's just gonna be really interesting to see where that goes because I, you know, if enough people were able to kind of come out of the woodwork together and have the equivalent of a class action against him, then he'd have to go, wouldn't he? So, I mean, I don't wanna believe that money can buy your way out of everything, which is kind of what I feel like we're seeing with him at the minute. If you've got that much money and that much influence, nobody can beat you but everyone's got an Achilles heel. It's just a matter of finding his. (laughs) (laughs) 
Should we end on that sort <laughs> of positive note? Trump's Achilles heel. Uh, that's, I think that's been great, guys. Thank, thank you for you. coming in, Nikki. You're welcome. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. <laughs>